Exchanges are, are a topic that we could go talk for much more than the 25 minutes in the, that they've allocated to us. And I think specifically we've seen the rise of uh, centralized exchanges. We've had this promise of decentralized exchanges coming in. We've got this whole dilemma about regulated and unregulated exchanges. And then we've got China who's thrown in this new curveball into exchanges, which is the transaction mining exchanges. So I think with all of those things, we could sit here and talk about all of those things forever. So I think I'm going to start off this panel by asking you guys a question. If you could invest in one type of exchange today, so you had a check, you could only write one check to one type of exchange, and your holding period is a, is a five-year holding period. So you can't sell, whatever you buy, you can't sell for five years. Where are you putting your money? And you can't say in your own exchange, okay? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's a very easy answer, actually. Um, so I, I uh, spoke about that with the Prime Minister of Liechtenstein, a similar question. And I think the, the next growth wave of the industry will come from institutional grade exchanges, meaning able to trade all kinds of crypto assets, including security tokens. So with these security token exchanges, we are looking in, a, in like building key infrastructure, not only for five years, but for the next 50 years probably. And it will disrupt the whole financial industry as we know it. Okay, so we are going to get to your answer. And did you hear the answer? Uh, Pablo, did you actually hear the answer or not? No, sorry. Okay, so the question is, you can think about it for a second. The question is, you've got decentralized exchanges, centralized exchanges, transaction mining exchanges, and a whole lot of other exchanges. The question is, if you could write one check, you only had one check, and you had to invest in an exchange, and you couldn't sell for five years, what exchange would you write the check for? Okay. Um, let's talk about securities tokens exchanges because there's a lot of questions that need to be asked about what that statement actually means. What is a security token exchange? L let's talk about the nuts and bolts of it. Is it an exchange that can trade an ERC-20 type token or an ERC-721 type token? What is a securities exchange? What are you actually investing in? T0 raised a hundred and who knows how much the real number is, but they raised a lot, a lot of money. You've had a, lot, a whole lot of other money being raised. What is a securities token exchange? What makes a difference from Binance? Yeah, so um, what is a security token exchange? Meaning like what's a security token is probably uh, what could be traded over there is, is part of the question. And I think what the industry needs is clarity and transparency in terms of like what is actually uh, this kind of token, this kind of token. So the, um, there is something in Liechtenstein happening which is called the Blockchain Act. So that's the new set of laws, a new framework being developed since one and a half years by the government and had been now bring to light in June and will ho hopefully pass end of this year or early next year. And they are categorizing tokens. Um, so there is a clear like a utility token, a payment token and a security token. And they also see, um, it define a token as being a kind of a container. So it could be filled up with different things. You could basically take an equity stake or part of a derivative or um, like any uh, real estate um, uh, share and put it into the container which is represented by the token. So the concept is very interesting. And then if you think about what is a security token, then you, we can like talk about the exchange of what it actually does. But I mean, if I, if, I, if I strip what you're saying, a token is a token is a token. It's a token that can, can be transferred on across this, this technology which we call the blockchain. Mm. And when you say a securities token exchange, are you saying an exchange which is built to be able to transfer blockchain tokens, which by the way, in a certain jurisdiction is licensed to trade this thing called securities? Hmm. Well, yeah. Sorry, if I could also jump yeah. in. Uh, we, you say a token is a token is a token, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we call a token if the thing behaves differently. So I can very much understand this argument that to have a securities token exchange, a place where, okay, we have these tokens which behave in a very specific way that is generally considered to be a security. And that behavior is defined by regulation? At this moment, it's the American legislation that it's very much defining that. But question is, yeah, I mean, we can always ask, should we just follow the American legislation or are, uh, are there more legislations who also agree how a security behaves and then do based on more than just one legislation? 
So you're saying that you're going to write your check to a exchange that is built that allows the, the transfer of blockchain tokens and by the way has a securities license regulation a securities a regulated securities license so so my answer would be a security token exchange okay um, that's i would have exactly the same answer and i think i was speaking with this with uh with monty earlier in backstage and um it's funny you asked that question to start because i am almost 99 percent convinced if i could write to your question one check to any any kind of a uh, exchange, it would be towards the securities uh, exchange where everything's going towards the STO path, very, very rightfully so. We're moving into a more kind of regulated environment as any kind of emerging asset class, let alone cryptocurrency, kind of moves towards. So that's the thing to your first question. And to your second thing around, you know, ERC20 or whatever kind of thing runs on the exchange, I think we're looking at different types of protocols. So if you look at Polymath and what they've done and looking at the ST20 kind of uh, standards, to that, I think you know, we come to a new kind of establishment. What is a securities token ex offering or exchange? It's something that will be compliant and the proprietary technology that goes into it is all going to be around you know, what the SEC has come to agreement with or kind of other um, first movers have already come up with and um, you know, has precedence rather that they are allowed to kind of subsist or exist within the regulatory framework and pass like you know, how we test and everything like that for normal securities. Are we under the same assumption here that we think that very soon, w w not, let's not say very soon, but soon enough, all securities will be on the blockchain. Are we, one, are we saying that in 10 years time, there won't be a single type of security that is not traded on the blockchain? I think that's a good statement. Um, I don't know if it will be in 10 years, but our assumption is really that we are still at the early beginning there has been kind of a proof of concept with utility tokens and the kind of the first wave of the industry. But the next wave will be much, much bigger, driven to do like any financial asset being tokenized. Okay, so I really don't want to spend the rest of this discussion talking about securities tokens because I've been talking about securities tokens for the last six months and I, I think we get, we get the gist of it. I want to tap on um, this topic of transaction mining. And um, first of all, does everyone here in the audience understand how transaction mining actually works? Yes, no, ha hands up if you don't. Does everyone on the panel understand how transaction mining works? Okay, so transaction mining works by returning the fees that you pay to trade on the exchange back to the users. So for example, if you're trading Bitcoin and you have to pay $100 fees for trading Bitcoin, you pay the $100 fees back, but you get a certain percentage of, those to of that money back in the tokens of, of the exchange. Now, the tokens of the exchange give you certain rights. Some of these tokens give you the right to a percentage of the revenue generated by the exchange. Some of these tokens give you the right to allocate the next token to be um, put onto the exchange. Some of them give you general voting rights. Essentially what they're doing is they're giving back the exchange to the people that traded on the exchange. So the more you trade, the more tokens get mined, the more tokens get given to you, and the more tokens you own, the more rights you have in the exchange. Um, these tokens have seen phenomenal returns. I mean, Fcoin, which was the poster child of all of this, had phenomenal returns. But since then, there's been a whole lot of others. There's BigOGo, there's uh, CoinPark, there's many other transaction mining exchanges. By giving back the revenues of the exchange to the community, is this a sustainable model? Well, it's hard to say at this moment. So it's right at the beginning. So it's how will it behave when more people get into it? Because one thing is when you have the real core fans who are super excited with what, whatever idea you came with. Another thing is when, you have, when all of a sudden it becomes so popular that you have any kind of person coming in and just trying to break the model. So how the transaction mining systems work is they only mine a certain number of tokens. It's a, it's a finite number of tokens, which effectively means the people that trade on the exchange first get the majority of the tokens, and, and then they can sell the, sell the tokens on the open market. I've seen some transaction mining exchanges uh, give 105% of the, the money back, and I've seen that those same type of exchanges buy back the tokens at 105% daily, which means that they really are putting their money where their mouth is. Now, again, do we think that that model is a sustainable model? 
from my perspective, I don't think it's a sustainable model. I mean, you look at the Fcoin model and you look at other variants that have come out, especially from our space in Asia, what we've seen a lot of the copycats come out. It's more a marketing tool and gimmick, in my personal opinion. So I, to your question, I don't think it is a sustainable model. You don't think that a transaction mining exchange is, is the answer to getting the community to trade an exchange that creates that network effect? Because I know that if I get revenues back every day by virtue of the fact that I hold the token, I'm going to get all my friends to trade on the same exchange, right? Correct. No, I com completely agree. The, the angle I'm coming from is more like, um, the way I think about it is just, right, ultimately in this current landscape it may work because everyone's so focused on the trading aspect of it. But like anyone also knows, if you're looking at cryptocurrencies as a point of technology, if there's no real adoption for it and people are just trying to play it like a gimmick, it's not a sustainable model. Well, let's let's work under the assumption that we're working under the assumption that cryptocurrency will have adoption. We have to start at that starting point, um, and, and then and then the question is, what is the future of exchanges? And is a transaction mining exchange a good investment? Should we be moving all our trading to transaction mining exchanges so we can start getting the tokens because we know about it early enough? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I I also have to agree, it's not a sustainable model it's always good to integrate the community and incentivize them but uh, i think where the future of a change is heading is not about incentivizing the community more but rather increase the community and have like several ways of joining them and that could be driven by either institutional investors coming in or creating substantial values for other people um, like you, you see where inflation is very high you always see jumps in um, where people flee into cryptocurrencies and that's where i see um, the, the bigger opportunities to make that happen and, and talking about incentivizing the community something it's just like a minor topic for me if you think in five years it, it like it's might be might be gimmick or whatever but it's so, not so I'm gonna challenge you on that and, and the reason is because I was initially a very big skeptic of, of transaction money exchanges when I met the guys from Fcoin and I met the guys from Bigogo I said I mean this is a fraud this is blatantly a fraud I then changed my tune to say it's actually not a fraud, but it's a very unsustainable model because you have an exchange that actually effectively has no revenues because all the revenues are paid back to, to the users. But as I dug more into the model, I actually think that the transaction mining concept around exchanges has done for exchanges what the utility token should do for networks. And it creates a community effect and a network effect that are second to none. And it puts the ownership of the exchange back in the hands of the community that are using it like a protocol. And for me, it seems like it's a, a very logical progression. And on top of that, I've done the mathematics and the mathematics actually do work. From my point, I mean, first thing that would come to my mind with a transaction mining model where especially you get 105% is that uh, I would just create a bot to do fake transactions all the time and make money out of that. And then, of, course, of course, then it looks like, wow, this, uh, this exchange, uh, it's working so well. People are there trading. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, what's the word, uh, capital, or there's a lot of liquidity going, yeah, liquidity going on. But as soon as it would hit some cap, as soon as there would be some restrictions, I would stop and go somewhere else. Like if I would really think just economically speaking, what would be my best economic interest? This is how I would behave. And this is what am I from hearing this about these models. I mean, you say the, the, you've looked at the math and that it could work. I could consider a 10, 20 percent return on the transactions and then making the whole eco ecosystem, maybe. But one where we give more than what the what the it's only, for certain, is. it's only for a certain period of time and of course the, the graph the, the graph then equalizes I think we, we are running a little bit short on time and I don't want to spend the whole discussion around transaction mining I think um, the takeout for me certainly was the more research I did into the concept the more actually f I went from being an absolute skeptic saying this is a I'll never forget I stood in front of one of the guys from FCO and I said you guys are blatant scammers and they actually weren't they're actually running they're actually running a, a con a, or they're pioneering a concept that might work. I do want to talk about a, the other category of exchanges, which is the decentralized exchanges. So last year, decentralized exchanges were the flavor of the month. Why? Because the centralized exchanges were getting hacked. We had a whole lot of big hacks in a row and everyone said, we don't want to store our money on the centralized exchanges. We'd rather trade from wallet to wallet. 
and we had a, a couple of decentralized exchanges um, start being developed. And I haven't heard about a decentralized exchange forever. I mean, I, I've been trying to see where the volume is. I see IDEX is doing okay. But what is the future of these decentralized exchanges? Does the community really want to store their tokens in a wallet and match them peer to peer? Or are we going to just move to a world where we have centralized exchanges which are insured? In other words, if they do get robbed, if they do get hacked, then there's insurance, like banks, today. Um, I think my perspective on that is you're, you're, you're right. I think we move towards a model where it's become, it becomes more centralized, right? unfortunately, just because of a liquidity issue. That liquidity issue is that I'm not sure if you've ever tried trading in a decentralized uh, thing. I've tried it several times. and. It's, it's very frustrating from a user point of view to actually be able to get any decent liquidity to do any kind of trades, even on the IDEX side. Because there's no adoption and because there's no volume. Exactly. But, but in that spirit, you have uh, applications like Total, T-O-T-L-E, and Total basically allows you to buy with one button to buy across all decentralized exchanges. So it's an aggregator of liquidity. So it's a function of, uh, it's a function of um, liquidity which is a function of adoption of decentralized exchanges. And I think the question that I'm asking is, does the user want the, his tokens to live in his own wallet and not to live on the exchange? Or is he going to be comfortable with his tokens living on an exchange and being insured? I want to add one caveat to that. Let's talk about the institutional investor. Let's talk about the day when, when the big institutions get onto blockchain. Are they going to want to trade in a centralized insured exchange? Or are they going to want to manage their own wallets and trade peer to peer? Well, I think that this is, um, it's one of the questions, but there's also a whole other bunch of questions in it. Uh, the, the fact about customer service, about ease of access, uh, these are all things where right now the decentralized exchanges have a harder time than the standard centralized ones, which is actually one of the things that we at Bexam are trying to, uh, pro to tackle. This is why we're going for what we call hybrid exchange, a hybrid solution where we try to take positive elements both from centralized and decentralized exchanges as sort of a halfway, something that would, that could, that would bring the security from decentralized trading but not making it so inaccessible for new traders. So recap for me, what are the advantages of a decentralized exchange? Well, for sure, you have the security. A decentralized exchange would, is much harder to hack than a centralized one. Okay, let's assume for now that we've got insurance, that yeah. all centralized exchanges are going to be insured. What are the advantages of a decentralized exchange? You so, can. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, I think the, the question here is completely right, so, uh, um, but sometimes we have to um, take a step back and see like, how the industry evolves. Um, and it, the concept of a decentralized exchange gives a lot of power to the ones who are trading with it so they can be their own kind of custodian service. Um, I've been running a venture fund in the, in the past five years and I know um, that you are actually as an institutional investor, sometimes you're not even allowed to do that on your own. So you need a service, a custodian service to do that for you. And if you have an exchange, for example, who has it as a package, it becomes more interesting and then they actually have to have an insurance, they have to go that path. For an institutional investor, it's not a question. But um, with entrepreneurship and the opportunities at the right time, there had been also social networks being developed early in the 90s, but the internet was not ready for that. And it's the same here. I think the concept of a decentralized exchange is great, but probably it's too early um, for, for had like massive adoption. So I'm challenging the viability of decentralized exchanges as a whole. And let me take you a few years forward. JP Morgan has a custodian service. It's called J Jamie Diamond's uh, Bitcoin custodian service. And they have a trading desk, which is called Jamie Diamond's Bitcoin trading desk. And the question is whether the custodian, because they, they own the custodian and they own the trading desk, are they going to trade this on a decentralized exchange or are they going to go and deposit their money into a centralized exchange? And I think that what I'm trying to get to here is, is there a need for peer-to-peer -peer decentralized exchanges when we solve the insurance issues? So the investors go there where liquidity is. Uh, so that's what Let's assume there's it. uptake and let's assume there's liquidity. Yeah. I don't think there is a need. 
uh, for that, at, at, at least not now. And I'd, um, also with the institutional investors we, investors we speak to, and my own perspective is they're, they're, they're not even loud. Um, with all the hurdles they are facing, they're all super interested to go in crypto assets, but they're facing all these regulatory issues. They, there are like barriers to entry for them. So to get them down, it's much easier to do that with a centralized model. Um, maybe later decentralized, but at the moment I don't see relevance for that. And, and again, I, I need to ask the question, is the only advantage of a decentralized exchange that they don't hold your funds in, 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 one, in one, one basket? I wouldn't say so. So another advantage that I see of decentralized exchanges is that they, they don't have a central server. They don't have a place, a one point of failure where you can go and hack, which is a standard place for, which is a standard thing for a more centralized institute, but they have it spread it around about multiple computers who help run the exchange. I think the idea of having a node server and then all of a sudden your computer goes off, but all the others around keep running the exchange, I think it's a very positive point. But yeah. that and, the, and the beauty of, the, of a decentralized exchange, actually in the concept, can be very powerful because we could create really a global financial market for the first time in history. So that's actually the, where we could end up, having really not only a NASDAQ in New York and London Stock Exchange and Australian Stock Exchange, but really having a global market who dominates it. And that's, that could be these, uh, like a decentralized exchange. But as I said, probably not now. Great, so we've got a few more minutes. And I think one of the topics that I've certainly heard here a lot today, and I think you guys have heard it as well, is that everyone here is very positive on non-fungible tokens and collectibles. And it seems to be that there's going to be a big race between what's going to be the flavor of 2019, whether it's going to be NFTs or security tokens. And 2019 will tell us that. Where are we going to trade the, the non-fungible tokens? If I'm holding a, a football card of, of one of my favorite football players and I'm holding this in the, in the form of a digital, digital token, where do I trade this thing? Frankly, I think the NFT will be a very niche market. So if, you, if I'm a fan of, let's say, League of Legends, a game, and I want to go and trade my skins, then it will be a very specialized exchange that will allow me to trade the skins. But it will not be a global exchange where everyone will be involved and would like to go into it. Because the idea of football card or a game skin having a value is something that might be for many people very difficult to accept. And okay, so I mean, again, we are running completely out of time. Any other, any other comments around non-fungible tokens? Are they going to be exchange traded or are they going to be peer-to-peer -peer traded on certain apps? I think there will be a particular exchange doing that. And so what we are currently preparing is making um, like a bigger announcement around LCX and our key equity partners. And one of the partners are actually closely involved with one of the major projects in that. So there will be experiments happening in that area. Okay, now, um, a few weeks ago, or a few days ago, I tweeted something on my Twitter. Um, my Twitter's at CryptoManRun, if you haven't seen it. Giving myself a little push. If you had a check to invest at the same terms, so the terms of the one deal are the same as the terms of the other deal. Let's say you had a check of $100,000 to invest, and your holding period is a five-year holding period. Would you put your money into Coinbase? Or would you put your money into Binance? Coinbase. Elaborate. Will you give us your thinking? Yeah, for sure. Um, I just think, I think where Coinbase is positioned and how they have that, um, let, let me put it this way, for Binance to turn, and I was having this conversation again with Monty just then, but for Binance to turn its direction for where it is now, it's a lot harder to do. And I think where Coinbase is actually positioned and built out the infrastructure in the, in the back end, it's, it's from an infrastructure point of view, as well as who's backing Coinbase, I think, from the more Fed reserve side of things, I think Coinbase would have a much better chance. So Coinbase is very highly regulated here in the United States. Um, they have very few tokens. You talk about an infrastructure that, that they've built. I'd like to understand what you mean by the infrastructure that you've built. Yeah, sure. So, so from, from my perspective, right, I feel like that Coinbase, especially moving towards this kind of, uh, like we touched on earlier, this STO side and everything, and to your point, I think it's everything around regulation that gives it that uh, edge over Binance, especially for Binance to kind of turn around where it is now. I feel like it's, a, uh, it's, it's like a behemoth that has already gained its marketing name. 
for it to then kind of take over or for it in the next five years to change its marketing play or put its strategies and whatnot, I think would be a much more difficult game for it. Yeah, I think it's Binance. Um, and the reason why is agility and entrepreneurship. Um, I think the leadership team of Binance is one of the very legit players in the, in the market. They want to get it right, but they also want to get it like quickly and fast. So they rather go to jurisdictions where they're welcomed, where they can work with them and create um, like a, a group of companies, not only one um, where they can do experiments um, and learn and see how it goes in a very legit and in a good way. So one of the experiences is actually with us in Liechtenstein, so that's Binance LCX, uh, the Fiat Gateway, which has been announced in, um, in this uh, August. So, and, and we will be like one of these group companies where we figure out what's the right way. So, and I think they taking the path of like being the agile player in the market, uh, rather than Coinbase who are trying to get it right right from the beginning. But sometimes um, it's, you have to be quick and then make it right at, at a later point of time. I knew I shouldn't have asked you because I, I actually forgot that you were the Binance partner. Paolo, I'm looking at you. So do you take your $100,000 and put them in Coinbase or Binance? I know we are out of time, so I'll keep it short. No comment. No, 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 that, 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 that's a chicken shit approach. <laughs> Come on, Coinbase or Binance and why? I don't like the offer of uh, you have to choose between these two big players. I, if I had a 100,000 check, I wouldn't go and look into the big ones. I would go and look into the new opportunities. And which new opportunities in exchanges would you put your $100,000 in? Well, of course, I cannot say our opportunity because that would be too cheap. No, I would really look at someone who's doing things differently, who's there adopting themselves to what the market is uh, demanding and uh, who, who's there out to grow and to develop. And that someone is? Well, as I say, I cannot say ourselves, Bexham. All right, guys, thank you. We're all out of time. Thank you very much.